Verse 12. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away in the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. So he's basically telling Amos, O oh, you prophet of God, we want you to go. Go back to where you came from. Don't let the door hit you in the behind on your way out. Go as quickly as you can. You're not welcome here. You're not wanted. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. And again, this priest, his livelihood depends upon being in the household of the king. So when Amos is preaching against the destruction not only of the northern kingdom, but also the destruction of the kingdom, the, the right of Jeroboam the second to rule, he's hitting this little priest... Right in his money belt. He's basically saying, your livelihood is gone. And, you know, most people don't want to hear that. Then answered, I love this. I love this. I love this. I love Amos for this. Then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. I didn't go to the school of prophets. I wasn't raised as the son of a prophet. But I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. He was a shepherd and he was a gatherer of wild figs that grew in these shrubs in Tekoa, in, in that area. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. So he's basically saying, look, I was just out doing what I do, and the Lord just came to me. And the Lord said, go, and he doesn't say this, but Amos went. When the Lord said, go, I'll go, Lord. So he went. Here, and this is where, this is where Amos really kind of gets the last little dig in on this little, on this little person. Now, therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel. And drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. Basically he's saying, when the Assyrians invade, your wife, is going to be made a harlot. We won't go into that. but And not just her, but all the women. Your sons and your daughters, if they're small enough, are going to be murdered. Everybody's going to, the land is going to be divided. Nobody's going to be safe. Every house is going to experience this from the highest house of the king to the lowest house of the poorest person. And he's so bold. He is. And even, I like that. Even, even, Knowing a consequence. That I like that. Happen. That's why I like Amos because Amos just really, I mean, Amos goes. He, um, you know, I mean, because in, um, like I said, when I prepared for this and I was reading in, and I was reading the notes and outlines of Dr. McGee, you know, Dr. McGee says, he says, I interpreted that he left. He left the Northern Kingdom, but he went back and he wrote the remainder of what was said. I got, a, I got a little point here that just came to me. The Lord, the Lord showing me here. Back up here to verse 9. Uh, Amos said, In the high places of Isaac shall be desolate. He's talking to Amaziah. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. This, this is to Amaziah. And I will r rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. That's actually before, though. This, this is what Amaziah I'm going to. Here. To ten, this is Amaziah speaking. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Now he's going to send to Jeroboam the king, but he's sending him this reply after verse nine, and he's saying his own death warrant. He says, yep. "Amoth has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel." Now he, this is Amoth, Amaziah that's conspired against the right. king. Right. Not Amos. The land is not able to bear all his words. Not Amos's words. 
It's Amaziah that the land cannot bear because of all his lies and deceit. That oh. he, he's trying to cover up God's correction, and he's saying... And that's he, why he wants Amos to basically get out of he's town. He's telling him to get out of town, but it's Amaziah saying that he's going to get him out of town, but it's Amaziah that's going to yeah, get out of town. True. And it's I mean, just the opposite. You could, basically, you could basically say that this is kind of like the situation similar to Xerxes and Haman. The same thing. It's the exact same thing. Haman hates Mordecai because he is trying to convince Xerxes that Mordecai, the Jews, want to take over everything. It's not the Jews. It's Haman. Same, same exact same thing. You're right. Thing. Yeah, it's the same spirit. And he's planning the death of well, the king. I don't know if he's. I don't know if he's going to do that or not because yeah. I think he wants to take over, but I don't think he's going to kill the king because not if he kills Haman, wanted to kill the right. King. I don't think Amaziah wants to kill the king, though, because the king is his bread and butter. He, he kills the king, and he's out of a job, potentially. So, I don't think he's going to do that. All right, chapter 8. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. Now, the summer fruit is a, is a picture of over-ripened fruit. And, again, I'm not an expert on growing things. I've grown a few things. I mostly buy my produce, I'll be honest. But whenever fruit, I've, I've bought it and it's become over-ripened. One of the things I've noticed about over-ripened fruit is it rots from the inside out. It turns nasty way down deep inside and it takes, it can take maybe a couple of days or something before you start seeing the little brown spots or smelling something kind of funny going on with the fruit. So, to me, the basket of summer fruit, that's basically the northern kingdom. They're rotting from the inside out because of the corruption of Baal, because of the corruption of Moloch, because of the corruption of Kayan, <laughs> of all of these pagan, this, these, the pagan worship that's, that's really been, been in place there since it goes back to Ahab and Jezebel. It was there before, but they're the ones that just really kind of set that path in motion. And it never really, and it just got worse. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Again, that is just, when I read that, that to me is so, that makes me shudder almost more than hearing about the cities, the desolation of the cities. Because when you don't have the presence of God, the presence of God and God passing by his people, that's what makes so many of the hardships and the things that we suffer in life bearable. That's the one thing that makes it bearable. And when God says, I am so fed up with you and I am so disgusted, I'm not going to pass by you again. That just, mm. he's had it. That's yeah, and it's and that is, yeah. It it my inside it, it makes my inside shake when I read that because I I'm like dear Lord please don't ever let me get to that point. Okay, here we go. And then verse three, and the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall come. Cast them forth with silence. Again, we have this silence. Now, I don't know if this is specifically referencing the ref the silence of God's people, but it says they shall cast them forth with silence. Um, I think it fits into what Myra and 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 uh, Jeffrey said earlier because so much, so many times, I'm guilty of this too. I am. We we go silent. And then, verse 4. Hear this, O ye that swallowed up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit? Again, this goes to the worship. Even if they did, when they did, try to practice, try to, I guess, give this half-hearted outward display that they are following God, 
the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. So they are just, everything is completely turned on its head. They've taken the law of Moses and they've just basically said, okay, that's the law. This is what we want to do. We want to seem, we want it to seem like we're outwardly worshiping God, but we're really not going to do what God says. And we're just going to do it our way. I'm thankful that that's one thing we don't have to worry about these days, aren't you? That that never, that, that still never happens. We don't see that anywhere, do we? I'm being rhetorical. <laughs> Um, you know, nobody does that anymore. Number, in verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. So, when people become so poor and needy they can't make ends meet, they will sell, but they, people will, will sell themselves into slavery. There was a, um, there is a, a portion of the, of the Mosaic Law that did speak to that, the specifics of that. Um, and the needy for a pair of shoes. For not, they're, and they're not even selling for things that, not to get ivory couches anymore, and the needy for a pair of shoes. So just to have the basics of life, just to make sure your feet are covered, so that when you walk out, you're not, your feet aren't covered in sores and blistered and cut. Just the, just the, Everyday necessities. That's, that's so sad. Verse 7. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob. Again, the pride hath sworn by the pride of Jacob. Surely I will never forget any of their works. He's not. He, he's seen what they've done. He's seen the pride of their hearts. He's not going to forget what they've done. And back up there where it says, And sell the refuse of the wheat. What's they, left over? They, yeah, they're selling. It's not the good part. Oh. Yeah, they're they're oh, selling the nastiness. Um, and then verse eight: Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. So basically, it's talking about the the land, you know. The land mourns. I mean, that you see, we saw that in Joel. We see that in other parts of Amos too, where that Jeffrey just read, where when God's judgment comes upon the land, it doesn't just come against the people; it comes against nature, and nature cries out, and it shall come to pass, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Now, what that is referring to is every year, mostly, the Nile would flood every year around the same time. And based on that flooding, it would leave the land, it would enrich the land with nutrients and would give and would leave a silt behind that made Egypt the breadbasket of the world. I mean, in the Roman Empire, Egypt was the breadbasket of the world. They fed most of the people. They fed Rome. And part of that was because of the annual flooding of the Nile. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Again, we have this image of the sun, the sun going dark, darkening the earth on a clear day. It doesn't specifically say this is the day of the Lord, but I mean, I think the imagery is clear. I think it's at least pointing somewhat to that, because that's that you get that with the day of the Lord. My footnote says that it's referring to an eclipse that was dated oh. 763 B.C. Okay. Well, learn something new every day. Um, I didn't know that. That's what years Amos was written. Well, it's not true, but it's uh, it's 687, but they're calling it 750. You know, yeah. But there is an error in our in our understanding. I didn't want to go in detail because I don't I don't have a way to prove that yet. But the, um, the only way, there's an error, uh, I'll bring that up later someday. Yeah, okay. let's, let's keep moving. Yeah, keep moving is what I mean. Um, verse 10, and I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentations, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head, 
and I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. So what he's saying is I'm going to turn the feast. It's going to be morning. Your songs are going to be songs of lament and woe because of what you suffered. You're going to be wearing sackcloth. You're going to, and the baldness upon every head, usually when people, when they would put on sackcloth and ashes, they would shave or at least, I don't know, cut their hair as a sign of mourning. The baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the mourning of an only son. The only son in a house. And basically, if that happens, you have only one son, and that son perishes, you can pretty much guarantee that that lineage is going to die out. So it's talking about the end thereof as a bitter day, the end, the end of this, the end of an era, the end of a sun, the end of time, the end of, the end thereof as a very bitter day. What's worse than losing a child? I can't think of anything. And in this day and age, and back in this time, losing a child was bad enough, but to lose the only son, that was especially, that was, that was really intense. That was, that was a loss like no other. Okay, and then this is, to me, this is the saddest. This, this is just really sad. Verse 11, and I have in the, in, the, in the head note above it, a famine of God's word, and that's just, that's just so heartbreaking. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And that is just so, so sad. Because the picture we have in the Bible, especially of Jesus, Jesus talked, he referred to himself as the bread of life. He's the bread. He's also the water of life. So there's no spiritual bread or water. There's nothing of God. God is just, he has completely left his presence. That is the closest thing to hell on earth that I think you can see. Because hell, apart from the fire, is also, I think the greatest and the saddest thing about hell is the complete and utter absence of God. God's presence is nowhere. Well, we don't have it yet, but we do no. have this family going on today. Right, but I will send a famine in the land, not a famine, but it's a famine of the word of God. Mm -hmm. And it's not hell, but it's it's a period. I mean, I think you could say it's a period of hell. I mean, because these people are going to be completely without a word from the Lord. What I want to express on this, expound, the problem is we know Jesus. We know baptism. We know the cross. But the, the thing is, in Hebrews... I think it's chapter 9. He said to move on into the deeper things of God. Mm -hmm. He said to, to do it. And, and the problem is today, people will just say something silly, and they don't. And that's why we're not here. You know, you're hearing salvation message over and over every day throughout the world. It's true, and that's good. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the milk, but the meat is missing. Well, and, and the thing that's sad about this is we don't have to rely on the audible word of the Lord coming to a prophet because we have the we have the, the word. The written. We have the Bible. Yes. And these people, they had the Torah, but they didn't but that, that I don't I, the law is not I, is not the complete word of God. I mean because there are things that God said to prophets that that weren't said in the Torah. I'm not trying to Does that make sense? Like I think that I don't know. They weren't following the Torah. They weren't following Moses. They were not following the law. This was all predicted. God and, said this was going to happen before right. it happened, and right. it was all it was all prophesied. And I, I could never understand that. Why why would these people do that? And what I don't understand is you think that somebody would turn to somebody and say, uh, "All right, we are think of this. Are, are we tired of this? What isn't it obvious that we aren't following God's law, and this is what law, God's law said?" And they never would. No, it's like the, the righteous, the prudent, they were kept their mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. That's sad, because they are going to be, 
They're going to be spiritually, they're going to be spiritually thirsty, and they're going to be spiritually starved. starved, and they're not going to get any relief. They're not going to get the cool touch of one little drop of water from the word of the Lord in their hearts. They're not going to get the filling and the satisfaction of being in the presence, knowing that you're in the presence of someone with the word of the Lord, and knowing that you... If you repent, you can you can be in God's presence again. They're not going to feel that, and that's why I think when I think of this, I think of this as this period. This is like a hell on earth because there is nothing of the presence of the Lord. He has completely taken His presence wow. away for a time, and it's and it's it just it breaks my heart. It really does. Verse thirteen. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. So even young people that should be healthy and vigorous and filled with life, they're going to be fainting. They're going to be because they're going to be thirsty and they're going to be hungry. Again, and this is again, I think a way for, for Amos to say this is everybody. This isn't just the old. This isn't just the young. This is every single person is going to experience this. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. So I think this is the people who say, Oh, we're in Samaria. We're on a hill. We're safe. No, you're not safe. They that live by Dan. Dan was the, the geographical location of Dan. It was very close to Philistia. And so, thy God, O Dan, liveth. I think that's talking about the paganism again, referring yeah. to all the paganism that's run amok in here. There's and the Lord. manner, and the manner of Beersheba liveth. They're going to be calling upon Samaria. They're going to be calling upon their gods. They're going to be calling upon the the tradition associated with Beersheba, with all of these things. And it's not. And there's. It's not going to be enough to save 